No. We're going to give it a few more minutes because we're expecting some more students. Isn't there a BJ's like right around the corner? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, we're oh, yeah, right down probably the block. five right. minutes from where we were. Yeah. Yeah. People will always look for something to complain about when there's change. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our January meeting. I'd like to go around the table. Uh, let's, let us stand first to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to wish everyone a very happy new year and hope everyone had a very happy holiday. Uh, I guess we'll start at the end and have, go have the introduction swing around. Rebecca Sannon, President and CEO of the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. Uh, Bill Miller, uh, Vice President of the Board and Chairperson of the Legislative Committee. Uh, Julie Lutz, Chief Operating Officer. I'm Fred Langstaff, I'm a board member and the clerk for the Circuit Post Houston, and I'm the President of the New York State School District. Sam Berkus, I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources for East Circuit Post Houston. My name is Molly West, I'm the <laughs> for that, for that. It's been a long time. 
Well, thank you, everyone, that's for the Kevin. introduction. And that's Kevin, oh, Kevin. Jimenez from my office. And Sorry about that, Kevin. <laughs> Um, what I would like us to do is uh, we need the acceptance of the minutes of December 5th, so you can just uh, browse the, uh, the minutes and we'll take a motion. Okay, we need a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Motion carried. I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Julie Lutz. Okay. It is with great pleasure that I um, introduce Rebecca to you. I've heard Rebecca speak on a number of things, but I've heard her speak uh, uh, regarding the census uh, in a number of different places on different occasions. And she is not only incredibly knowledgeable and well-spoken, but very passionate about this vitally important topic. So very happy to have her here. Um, I would ask folks in the room, as you already know, to remind folks who weren't able to come but maybe are still interested in this topic that we are uh, live streaming it and archiving that. It'll be on the BOCES YouTube channel. So folks who weren't able to be here can, can watch it. But let me just tell you a little bit more about Rebecca. She is, as she said, President and CEO of the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island, which is an umbrella organization with a network of 150 nonprofits. She served for five years as Assistant Deputy County Executive for Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone. And for several years prior to that, she worked in, in the nonprofit sector, engaged in policy planning and education, focus group development and facilitation, diversity and cultural competency training, early childhood professional development and strategic planning in government and political capital development. In addition, she taught various psychology courses as, as an adjunct professor at Dowling, Suffolk Community College, and Iona College, teaching undergraduate students. She has a proven record of leadership and professional development, performance management, strategic analysis and planning, policy making and direct services, has established key partnerships in a variety of emerging areas, including community development, leadership development, social policy and civic engagement. Um, I happen to know she brings all of those skills to her leadership at the Health and Welfare Council and really was an amazing fit for that, that position. Um, in her first two years there, she refocused the attention of of that group on the critical needs of families and children across Long Island, bolstering the services that HWCLI provides to support them. As she develops new relationships and nurtures existing ones, Rebecca emphasizes the advocacy that impacts underserved communities in that region, using her background in government and strong community ties. She has engaged valuable stakeholders and policymakers into the broader dialogue addressing equity across Long Island. She's a strong advocate for systems change and believes that Long Island, as America's first suburb, can lead and effectively can lead on effectively eradicating suburban poverty. As the Stein Scholar, Rebecca earned a Juris Doctor from Fordham. She holds a Master's degree in Developmental Psychology from Teachers College, Columbia University, where she was a fellow at the National Center for Children and Families. Rebecca lives in Huntington Station with her husband and two children, her cat, and two dogs. <laughs> so. That is a little bit of information about Rebecca, and we are about to learn a lot of information about the 2020 census. Let me turn the PowerPoint back on. I move to the side. Um, this microphone is picking up for the YouTube okay. video, but otherwise people probably can hear from the back of the room, right? Is there a... Oh, a clicker. I'm just going to click for her. Oh, okay. okay yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. No problem. Do you want me to do this so you can take notes? over here something's going on there we go um, thank you everybody thank you so much to Julie um, for inviting me here tonight it really is a privilege um, to be able to be here with you and to talk about this topic which is so critical um, I really truly cannot think of a topic that is more critical right now in our country and in our state and in our region than making sure that we get an accurate count and that Long Island gets the dollars and the programs and the services and the infrastructure that it deserves for the next 10 years you can switch um, so why do we need to get a complete count in the census? First of all, participation in the census is vital because it affects our lives as a whole. When you think about everything that you care about as educators, um, 
you know, about child development, about your families, about the sustainability of your communities, it's all impacted by making sure we have an accurate count in 2020. Census data is used to decide how much funding our region receives annually. And I can tell you, as somebody who is presenting all over the state, many people don't realize this. Many people know about the political implications of census and redistricting, but they don't realize the funding implications are so significant and that it sets a 10-year funding precedent. So for example, as educators, if one of you had a two-year-old at home and you didn't count that child in the census, until that child is done with elementary school, your school district would not get the dollars it deserves for Title I and Title III and IDEA funding and the school lunch program and so many of the programs that your school districts get funding for based on census data. The census affects funding levels for our schools, for our roads, for our health insurance, for our hospitals, our public programs, and so much more. So, Truly, we all count, and we all benefit when everybody is counted. Please switch. And we have a really interesting situation here on Long Island. We are one of the most segregated regions in all of the country. We know this, right? You go to Nassau County, you see Garden City right next to Hempstead. And you know that children by pre-K are essentially tracked for radically different outcomes based on opportunity. We see that in Suffolk too, right? We have Wine Dance right next to Dix Hills. Tremendously different resources for children um, who live in very close proximity to one another. We are also living in a time when the poverty rate is the highest it has been since 1959. Nassau County at 6.1%, Suffolk County at 7.6%. It might not sound like a huge number, but when you drill down to the numbers, it's very significant. And the thing about the poverty level is it's determined by federal, a federal formula that does not reflect our high cost of living here on Long Island. So you can be making $85,000 a year for a family of four, and still not be able to meet a very basic survival budget. Still not be able to pay for childcare and transportation and keeping the heat on in your home and food on your table. So we have significant challenges and cannot lose a penny that we deserve as a region. Almost 300,000 households on Long Island have incomes that are technically above what I was saying, the federal poverty guidelines, meaning they don't qualify for critical programs. So many programs that support our families things that help with nutritional security and child care and, and Head Start and all of these programs, if your income is above a certain threshold, you don't qualify. And yet that doesn't mean you're not experiencing poverty. These families and individuals are still not meeting their survival budgets for housing, food, child care, transportation, and health care. In 2014, on Long Island, one in four adults faced food insecurity at one point during the year. It's a complex problem that we know affects many children. And all of you as educators, you know the impact on children, right? When children are not adequately nourished, they can't pay attention. <coughs> you see behavioral issues. You see, I mean, I think about as adults, right? If, if I can't get my cup of coffee in the morning, forget food. <laughs> it's a challenge to be around <coughs> me for a little bit of time. Um, imagine you are a young child with your brain very much still developing. Um, having to function in the school environment without being adequately, adequately nourished. 39% of Long Islanders who receive emergency food are children under 18 years of age. And there are 160,000 people who live here right now who don't have the means to adequately meet their nutrition needs. That means that they are struggling tonight to figure out how they're putting dinner on the table. That means tomorrow morning when they wake up, they're not sure what they're going to feed their families. And as you know, children who are hungry are more likely to have social, cognitive, and behavioral issues. Next. So the census is the key to Long Island's future. And if I sound passionate about it, it's because it's, it, there is nothing that keeps me up more at night right now than the importance of making sure we get an accurate count. The census impacts everything that affects us from the basic building blocks of healthy communities, as I've been sharing, schools, hospitals, food programs, emergency services, and infrastructure, right? How many of you lived here during Superstorm Sandy? Right? Okay, most of you. The community Block Development Grant, the funds that are used for disaster recovery are determined using census data, CDBG funds. So if we don't know, if the government doesn't know how many people live here, we only get the do dollars to help recover and help promote resiliency for the people that the government knows are here. So an undercount even impacts disaster recovery to the number of government representatives that we elect. Census data also serves as a framework for businesses as they make decisions. So I've been speaking of chambers of commerce all across the state 
And I can tell you that chambers and businesses look at census data when they decide where to locate. So when you think about empty storefronts and you think of some of our main streets that you know we've been hearing about revitalization for decades, right? If we really want to revitalize our communities, we need to make sure we're accurately counting folks so the data reflects the customer base that exists for businesses to move in. Um, the 2020 census will affect and will set the, the precedent for funding for the next 10 years for programs that children deserve. So I can't speak enough to you tonight about how important this is to the future of our kids. You know, many of us um, get complacent in our lives. We're doing so many things. We're so busy that filling out another form or doing another thing seems like just another effort. But the bottom line is, if we want to protect the future for Long Island's children, this is the, this is the most important thing a parent can do to affect the sustainability of their child's future. This is the most important thing you can do to affect the sustainability of your community. Look at the funding on an annual basis for federal Pell Grant, for federal student loans, for Title I grants, for state, the children's state health insurance, national school lunch programs, special education, Head Start, WIC, school breakfast, and more. These are the basic building blocks of making sure that children are healthy and have what they need. The 2020 affects access to healthy foods through SNAP, which is what used to be known as food stamps, the national school lunch program, and the school breakfast program. These dollars are determined using census data. The 2020 census affects our access to health care. Medicaid is the biggest program that is funded using census data. You know, those of you who heard the governor's speech yesterday heard, you know, we have some serious challenges in the state budget this year, right? And Medicaid is one of those challenges. Well, if we want to make sure that our families have access to health care, we need to make sure people are counted. We all in this room believe that children's health insurance program must be funded, must be funded to meet the needs of children. So we need to make sure we get an accurate count to do that. Next. Um, the 2020 census affects the money we receive for affordable housing. Affordable housing is a big challenge here on Long Island, isn't it? It's a huge challenge. So Section 8 and very low to moderate income housing loans and Section 8 housing assistance payments programs, these are all funded using formulas that use census data for funding. The census affects the money we receive for our roads, public works, and even disaster recovery. So I like to tell this joke. It was, um, it was brought up by Mitch Pally from Libby. Many of you probably know who he is. Um, he said to me, Rebecca, it's kind of like, you know, do you want a pothole filled in Houston, Texas, or do you want a pothole filled on the Long Island Expressway? And people usually giggle about that, but it's reality. The dollars are going to be distributed nationwide. These dollars are going to be distributed. Whether or not Long Island gets its fair share, is up to us, and we already know. We spend more, we send more money on Long Island to Albany than we get back, and New York State sends more to DC than we get back. And our taxes are high. If we wanna put downward pressure on our taxes, we need to make sure every dollar we're entitled to comes back to us. Um, so the impact of the census. So the health and the, the representation and health of our democracy is really important. The census determines how many representatives each state has in the House of Representatives, Following the 2010 census, New York, lo New York lost two seats. You know, we are poised, if we are, if we have 0.6% or greater of an undercount, we are very likely to lose one, potentially two more seats. Um, a census data is also used to determine electo electoral college votes. And a complete count in 2020 means New York will have its fair share of representation in government. You know, this is absolutely not a political statement, but I talk to people all over the state and certainly all over Long Island every day who are concerned about our country right now for different reasons, are concerned about what's happening in Iran, are concerned about um, climate change, are concerned about the future of, of their communities for the future of their children. We can't afford to lose New York's voice in DC. We have to make sure that New York and the needs of our children and our families are adequately represented. Next. So we have serious challenges to, to getting an accurate count. And I don't mean to scare you, but if I was, you know, to be doing this for a video, this would be the part that, where there's horror movie music playing. Um, so we have a lack of federal and state funding. So the federal government has not put the dollars into this so far that has existed in, in past years. Hiring has been slower. There haven't been those procurement opportunities that have existed in the past. At the state level, the Fiscal Policy Institute had a number that they said we needed you know, which was 40 million for the state to have an accurate count. The final budget landed on up to 20 million. 
Um, and those dollars have not been distributed yet. Um, so we also used to have the Hagedorn Foundation on Long Island, which is no longer here. So there's a really significant lack of dollars invested in those you know, small grassroots trusted messenger organizations to get the word out about census. Second challenge is the digital divide. So this is the first census where when you hear from the Bureau for the first time at the end of March, most of you will get something in the mail with a link that says go online and complete the census digitally. Now to be clear, you don't have to do it digitally. You can do it on the phone in 13 languages. You can do it on paper. If the Census Bureau has not heard from you by their fourth attempt, they will send it in paper to your house. Um, or certainly you can do it face to face with an enumerator. But we have big concerns because they're going to be pushing the digital completion. And we know that that opens up all sorts of challenges with scams. Um, and that for many people, they may not have digital literacy and go on and think they completed it and not have completed it. But you can imagine the scams that are going to come forward, right? Yeah. People saying, hey, so all you have to do to complete is give us your mother's maiden name and your PIN number. Or you know, pay $5 to certify that you've really completed the census. So we're very concerned about that. Fear and distrust of the government and the anti-immigrant sentiment and climate of fear is real. Lots of people, because of the hacking that has gone on with companies like uh, you know, Target and others, um, people are very nervous about giving out their personal data at all. Um, couple that with a time in which the trust in government is um, precarious and the shifting immigration policies in this country which have made many of our residents on Long Island live in the shadows, um, really, really separate from participation in community. And so we have a significant challenge to be able to reach folks and send the message of trust Title 13 protects of the U.S. Code protects this information from being shared with any other entity. So the Census Bureau will not share your information with ICE or Homeland Security. But you see articles. I saw an article yesterday that was forwarded to me saying Homeland Security is sending information to the Census Bureau. And the answer is yes. So does the Federal Post Office. So do many federal agencies. They send it to the Census Bureau. But the Census Bureau legally cannot validate it, confirm it, or share information back. And I will tell you that if a census worker were to share information, they face significant fines and jail time. So it's, it's a very um, significant tool, um, or certainly information that you need to have in terms of uh, reassuring communities. But we have a huge challenge there. Um, lack of affordable housing and the prevalence of multifamily homes. Many of the children that you work with and many of the families that you work with are living multiple families in single family, family dwellings. We have lots of people on Long Island renting rooms, renting basements, um, converting living rooms into bedrooms, doing all sorts of things to, to make sure that they can survive and sustain their lives. The challenge is, since they're not registered addresses, the Census Bureau is likely not to know about them. So they're likely not even to hear from the Census Bureau. So we need to have a whole self-initiation campaign that says, hey folks, if you haven't heard from the Census Bureau by April 1st, we need you to call this number, tell the Census Bureau you're here and that you want to be counted, that you count and that you deserve to be counted. Um, and then quite frankly, you know, I used to, I've done so many of these presentations and I used to say that the fear and distrust of government is the biggest hurdle we face. And what I've come to realize is actually the biggest hurdle we face is the lack of information about the census. Because it comes every 10 years, people do not pay attention to it and they have no idea. And I can tell you, I speak to folks all the time whose business models are directly impacted by census data and they have no idea. So they're not paying attention to the fact that there's a significant funding impact for Long Island. Next. Um, so what we've done is we have these complete count committees, um, which I'm working with the county executives in Nassau and Suffolk County. We've got 350 organizations that are part of, part of it from business, faith-based, um, education. Our education committee is chaired by uh, Superintendent Lars Clemenson from Hampton Bays and Mike Nagler from Mineola. Um, you know, and it's 11 subcommittees in total that we put together um, to educate our communities about the importance of census, to provide detailed and updated information, um, and to really coordinate the exchange of best practices. And to do that, we've built 11 toolkits so that we can give it to folks and say, oh, you have a hospital? Here's what hospitals can do. Oh, you run a union? Here's what your union can do. Oh, you have a school district? Here are things that are very easy for your school district to do. We, none of this is proprietary. We want to give it out. We want people to use it. We want to make sure people get counted. Next. Um, so you can help. So first of all, all of you came in here tonight thinking you were going to have delicious homemade cookies and drink some water and listen to a presentation. And you didn't think that you were going to leave with homework. Um, but I'm a homework giver. You know, I'm sorry. Um, so at the end of the day, you're all census ambassadors now. You've heard the message. 
You've heard how vitally important this is. You need to be an ambassador. You need to leave here tonight engaged and excited about the opportunity that faces us in 2020 during a time in which so many of our neighbors are struggling to make a difference and to get the message out and get the word out about the impact of the 2020 census. So what you can do is share information with your classrooms, your sports teams, your clubs, student government, to the families that you work with, right? To let them know that they need to be counted, that your communities need their participation. And there is almost a spiritual component to this, and I, I can tell you personally from, from doing so many of these speeches, particularly when I'm doing them in communities, the notion to some people that they count right now is not something that they've heard a lot about. And so when you say to families, we need you to be counted because you're here and you matter and we see you and you count. It's very powerful and it can be a tool to do much more than just get the census completed, but to create engagement and create empowerment. Next. Um, become a census ambassador. Use every opportunity you have to share the importance of census. Whether you're talking about your student government, your student teams, everything that you can to get the word out. And I can tell you, for example, I mean, the holidays in my family, I mean, I don't know that they're gonna come to my house anymore because you know, we're sitting around the Christmas tree opening up gifts and I'm talking about the census. Thanksgiving dinner, lots of you know, different in-laws and everybody's at the table and cutting the turkey and I'm talking about food security and how that impacts the census, right? Um, there's no place where you can't talk about this. Um, you know, I get asked a lot to talk about things like um, you know, mental health infrastructure and immigration and um, access to healthcare and SNAP and there's nowhere that I've gone where I haven't figured out the link to census and been able to bring it up. And I've helped the county executives to do the same and they are doing it everywhere they go, as are so many of our elected officials, making sure that folks know that this is real and it has a huge impact. But we need you to do it as well. Um, promote the census to your social network. If you have social media that you use, make sure you're talking about the census. Make sure that as trusted messengers, you're telling the people who believe in you about how this is so important. Quite frankly, if each of you made the commitment tonight to leave here and find 10 people, 10 families, that you were going to assure complete the census, that would be a very significant investment of your time. We need to create a culture around the census. We need to create momentum. So just like I would be embarrassed to tell my friends that I didn't vote, you know, we want people to feel that sense of civic responsibility, that this is about the future of your community. Next. Take the pledge. We have a pledge on our website, which is www.hwcli.com, where you can click on and you can pledge to complete the census. You fill out your information. Come April, we're going to remind you, hey, remember you said you would complete the census? This is the time to do it. And I can't speak enough about the importance of doing it early. So you're going to start hearing from the Census Bureau at the end of March, April 1st is Census Day. We need everybody who's willing to do this easily to do it right away because the Census Bureau is gonna be updating on a nightly basis completion rates across Long Island. And people like me are gonna stay up all night and look at them. And we're gonna figure out where people are completing them at a high rate and where they're completing them at a low rate. And then target our outreach efforts in the areas where they're a low rate. So anybody who's already gonna to plan to do it needs to do it early so we can focus our attention on the people that are harder to reach and harder to count. Um, so that pledge is really important. Include the pledge and the logo in your email signature. Or make up your own thing to include in your email signature. But I know I send hundreds of emails a week, and many of you do as well. Those are all touch points, right? So making sure you have something at the bottom that says, please complete the 2020 census by, you know, before the end of April, or however you want to put it, um, is really powerful. You're touching people, and they're like, wow, that's important to Julie? Wow, Julie's someone I really admire and respect. I better think about that. That's how you trigger conversations. Um, voicemails, you know, very soon, like sometime in the next two weeks. If you call me, you're gonna get, you know, you reach Rebecca Sanon, President and CEO of the Health and Welfare Council, please leave a message. The 2020 census is coming. I need you to complete it. I mean, there's gonna be a pitch on my office voicemail, on you know, our organization's voicemail, on my home voicemail, on my cell phone, on my husband's cell phone, on everybody whose cell phone I can get my hands on. Um, because again, we need to create that momentum and we need to do these simple creative things to do that. Um, so please consider that. next. Magnify your voice. So if you were a student, I, I wasn't sure if there were gonna be students here today, so I talked about your school newspaper, um, you know, articles in the school newspaper, right? I could tell you something, Kevin, who works for me, is someone I absolutely adore. And if he asks me to do something, I try to help him to the best of my ability. But if my kids ask me to do something, I drop whatever I'm doing and I do it. 
We all listen to our children. And so getting kids engaged in this and our student body engaged in this to go home and say, hey, mom, dad, this is really important to me, that's very important. So thinking about ways to get kids involved, but also for you, your local newspapers, your school newsletters, to have information about the Census Incorporated. I mean, Long Island has 124 school districts, and we're very school district centric, right? We, we have pride in our school districts. We care about our school districts. Almost nobody knows that funding for school districts are impacted by census data. I mean, in the general community, that is not a well-known fact. So we need you to raise that mantle and, and tell people that as much as you can. Um, jobs with the Census Bureau are now $23.50 an hour. If you have young people who are looking for part-time jobs, tell them to go on the Census Bureau website and apply. That's a great um, hourly wage and it's work in the community. And we need the Census Bureau to hire people who live in the community, who are comfortable with the community, to be the ones knocking on doors. Because all of us know in 2020, we don't really like it when people knock on our door. Um, so we want to make sure that folks see a friendly face and someone that's familiar to them. Um, and you know, really making sure that you know that you know everything that you do to raise the mantle about the census, every chance that you have to touch someone is an opportunity to bring dollars into the community that's going to impact the future of children. Next. Um, the census affects everything that makes Long Island a healthy, sustainable, and desirable place to live. We have these really significant challenges. Long Island's future depends on a complete count. And so truly, I am counting on you. Um, I'm counting on you to make sure that you raise the mantle, that humanity counts, that Long Islanders count, that is America's first suburb. As Julie said before, I truly believe we can solve the complex problems we have. We can lead the nation in what it means to come together, even though we are massively segregated, what it means to come together to value one another. Um, and to make sure that we get, as a region, what we need to support the future of our greatest and most precious asset, our children. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, happy to answer questions. I have cards. I'm happy to, to talk to you afterwards. And I just thank you so much for your time and for your commitment to finding at least 10 people to talk to after this. <laughs> thank you. Any questions, Julie? Absolutely. So the, the, first of all, the census. If you have somebody who does not want to answer all the questions on the census, we always want to encourage people to answer the census to the best of their ability. But if they skip one question, that doesn't mean they won't be counted. So if there is a question on the census that they're not comfortable answering, um, you know, we still want them to answer it to the best of their ability. That's important to say. But the citizenship question is not going to be on the census. Um, so the, the census is not going to ask about citizenship. The census will never ask for information like your PIN number, your mother's maiden name. It will not ask for the last word of your social. It will not ask for those kinds of identifiers. You will never have to pay to complete the census. Um, you know, one of the scams that we've heard about is, you know, people saying, you know, you need to certify the completion of your census for it to be counted, and that costs $4.99. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you do never have to pay um, to complete the census. So, um, you know, we really want people to understand it's easy, it's quick, um, it takes about 10 minutes to complete. It's not, you know, this isn't you have to plan your Wednesday evening to complete the census. This is something you can do on the phone, quite frankly, on your way to work, on Bluetooth, of course. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's really simple. Thank you. Yeah. you say it starts April 1st? What is the term of the census? I'm glad you asked that question. So you'll start to hear from the Census Bureau at the end of March. Um, since April 1st is Census Day and then it goes into August. And the Census Bureau hasn't released exactly what date in August it will end. Um, but you know, we want to, again, as I said earlier, do everything we can to get people to do it earlier. We also know that the, you know, once enumerators start going out, which will be sometime in May, there's also more of an opportunity for scams, for people to show up pretending to be the Census Bureau. So we want to really do everything we can to get our communities to complete it early so they don't have to get a knock on their door. Yes. So you said that we would possibly lose two representatives. We have 27 now. Where would that be that we'd lose? I know upstate has lost a million people in the last three years. 
where would that person be from? Not likely, you? not likely down here. Um, but you know, I, I haven't gotten so in the weeds with that to, to answer, but more likely um, upstate and not likely down here. But you know, the concern is it's New York State and it's our voice in, in DC, and we need to make sure that we have a robust voice um, in Washington, DC. You said something about a toolkit. I have a, a member of a union that mm -hmm. we are active. We just talked about this today at a yep. retirement meeting. How do they get the toolkit? Absolutely. So if you give me your card, I'll send you all the toolkits. We're going to have them. We're going to have our website, which we've been going through some renovations on, completed by January 21st, and they'll all be on there. So people can go on and download them and use them. We have toolkits for senior, people who work with senior citizens, young children. Children zero to five are historically undercounted. They were undercounted by over a million in the decennial 2010 census. Um, we have it for immigrant communities. We have it for local government. We have it for education. We have toolkits for faith-based leaders, for business, for unions, for hospitals. I'm sure I'm missing a few because it adds up to 11. Um, but but it's, it's very robust, and we worked really hard on them. We spent a lot of time um, perfecting them and working with different organizations to make sure that they were easy turnkey operations for folks. You said that it was 2350 for the people. Would they work in their own area, or would they be assigned to like maybe another area that's, that's so under So the Census Bureau has assured me that their goal is to get people to work in the communities in which they reside. And that's very important. I mean, I could tell you stories from 2010 that I heard in the last uh, eight to 10 months about you know, people who were doing this work who didn't live in the community and didn't feel safe or didn't feel comfortable or sat in their cars and counted people as they walked by. I mean, you know, we need to make sure that people who are doing this work live in the community, that they're trusted faces, um, and that they're welcomed at the door and not, they don't cause fear, they don't cause more anxiety in a time when so many of our families are living with that anxiety on a daily basis. Yes? Hi, um, these census workers, they have ID, right? Yes, they do, but yeah. yes. Um, and I don't mean to, certainly I don't want to uh, discourage anyone from answering the door for a census worker, but we know, I mean, I know personally, even like if Amazon knocks on my door to sign off on a package, I'm suspect. You know, it, it, in 2020, we don't answer our doors to people we don't know that often. And so that is particularly true in some of our communities that are, you know, really living in fear and really living in the shadows. And so we want to do everything we can to get people to do it willingly on their own and also to take ownership and pride in it. I mean, this is an exciting moment where you can do something that impacts the future of your community just by completing some questions. And that's that's really meaningful. That's empowering. Could you explain again to the uh, people here uh, why children are so important to be counted on the census? Yeah, so children zero to five are historically undercounted. Um, on the census, and there's a number of different reasons for that. Um, one is, a, believe it or not, many people don't think of their babies as residents of their household. I'm here to tell you they are. <laughs> Anyone who's heard a baby cry should know that they are. Um, but, but many people don't think of that when they're completing it. Another reason is that a lot of times parents are like, well, I don't put my child's information on social media. I don't put it anywhere. This is, uh, this is how I protect my child. But again, this information is protected. But Every single program, if you go through the list of programs that I put up here earlier, and we could certainly send information out to you, and I know there's some information in your folders, so many of the programs that the census data impacts have to do with child development. Head Start is funded using census data, right? You know what it is when a child gets to kindergarten, and they've had no exposure um, to environmental stimulation. They haven't had the tools that they need while their brain is developing the most between zero and five right, the most rapid time of development across the lifespan, they haven't had that opportunity. Um, school lunches, um, you know, SNAP, a WIC, which is for mom and babies, are most vulnerable, moms and babies, to be able to get nutritional security. All of these programs that support child development are impacted using census data. For our schools, it's Title I, it's Title III, it's school lunches, it's special education IDEA funds, all funded to a degree using census data. So we have to, if we can't, listen, this is like the, the call to action that I can make. Everyone in this room is an ambassador for children. Being an ambassador for children means you need to be an ambassador for census, because this is how we make sure Long Island's children get what they deserve, and we have a future that we can count on here. Any other questions? Yes? It could be a silly question, but what type of information or questions is asked on the census? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, where you live, it's your gender, it's your how you identify your ethnicity, um, you know, how many people live with you, that kind of information. And that's why it's also important to know about Title 13, because it doesn't just protect you from Homeland Security and ICE. Let's say you're a landlord and you have more people living in your house than they sh than should live there. It's okay.
because filling out the census is not going, I don't mean to say it's okay, I mean to say it won't hurt you for, to fill out the census um, because it, the information won't be shared with your county or your town for permitting violations. Salary, no. no. Other questions? Yes? How does it get involved in this work? <laughs> Good question. So I run an umbrella organization that works on every area of health and human services across the region, everything from uh, disaster preparedness to, um, you know, WIC and SNAP and looking at best practices around food policy for the state. We do advocacy at the national, state, and local level. We do policy work. We do grassroots coalition building, and we do some direct services. You know, it was back um, a bunch of months ago, actually a year ago now, um, I was meeting with the Long Island Community Foundation and we were talking about the census coming and trying to figure out where it would sit. Um, and quite frankly, everything that I work on, everything that my career is built on is impacted by census data. So I said, well, let's work together and figure out if, if we can build this model and build a model that really creates an army, you know, an army of love, not of hate, an army that is weaponized with knowledge, um, an army that is able to lift each other up um, which is what I really believe we need here in our region anyway. Um, and that, you know, utilizing that tool for census can really um, increase our value set across the state and across the nation and make sure that we get what we need as a region. So really just looking forward and seeing how important it was and making sure that we did everything we could as a region to get what we deserve. And I always joke that I'm the, you know, sort of female version of Billy Joel. Not that I can sing the way he can, but I love Long Island the way he does. And so, you know, Knowing that we have so much to lose, it, it just became very personally important to me to, to raise the mantle. Any other questions? Yes? You know, I think I've heard you speak about this. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but can you talk historically about, you know, kind of like the, the origination of, of the census and um, You haven't heard me speak about it. Um, that's okay. Um, but, you know, the census goes back uh, a long way. It's actually funny. We were, um, I was working with our faith-based subcommittee recently, and I said, you know, if we go back in scriptural text, we can find information, you know, about the census, you know, going back um, to that point in time. And, and um, it's something that I think people forget is a civic duty um, and that it has been a civic duty. And when you look back at um, your, you know, your census from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago on Long Island, it's incredible to see the changes and to see how Long Island has changed as a community, um, as, a, as a region, um, to see, quite frankly, the demographic shifts. Is one of the things that I tell people, we have a lot of maps out there that we were handing out originally with the 2010 data. And I've kind of pulled back a little bit from it because I don't want people to over rely on it. Um, because Long Island of 2020 is not the Long Island of 2010. We've changed dramatically. And when we look at our immigration, you know, a lot of times people think about the word immigrant and they have a picture of what they think in their mind. And quite frankly, we have such diversity <coughs> among our immigrant population here on Long Island and among the folks who have come here in the last 10 years. Um, so it's really great to be able to look back on the historical data, understand what, how we've changed. And then by the way, as Eastern Suffolk BOCES or as any government entity, to be able to use that data and reflect and say, you know, do our programs represent the demographics that are here today? You know, does this RFP that we've had for a certain period of time still make sense? Or do we need to reimagine how we provide services or how we do outreach or how we, you know, how we engage in folks? Um, and that's really important. Other questions? No? Is the literature that we, if we went out and knocked on our neighbor's door and left something, is it like a palm card or We literature? have them, absolutely. We're happy to get them to With you. something simple, not like Yep, this super area. simple. Yes. yes, absolutely. Super. And I'm working with, you know, the assembly in the state. I'm working with folks all across to, to develop letters and palm cards and things that are very um, clear and easy to digest in Spanish and English and Haitian Creole and languages that folks um, speak in different communities on Long Island. Yes? I'm just curious how you would, like, illegal immigrants are probably not going to buy the, the fact that they're not going to give it to ICE. So, so folks who are here who are on DACA. Not ICE, ICE. That's okay. I, I knew what you meant. So folks who are here who are undocumented, um, many families are living in tremendous fear, right? And so when you look at, for example, on Long Island, over 11,000 children have come here from 2014 to 2020 as unaccompanied children. That's an enormous demographic shift in itself, right? They have endured um, pre-migration, migration, and post-migration trauma to be here, to sustain and to secure a life, 
you know, having the same hopes and dreams that my kids have, right? Um, families have gone through extraordinary lengths to get to America because of that very basic fact, public safety, education, hope, and opportunity. And so the way that we position this, and we've worked with you know, experts in the field for the last year, um, is really to talk about how this is the single most important thing you can do to sustain that dream for your children. And that Title 13 is real. Title 13 does protect you. Um, and I think, quite frankly, one of the most important things I can say on this topic is it's, a, it's not just about the message, it's about the messenger. If I go into a community that doesn't know me, and I don't speak the language, and I have something written, and I'm handing it out, why would anybody trust me? Why would anybody listen to me in, in this climate? Nobody would. But identifying those trusted messengers in community to be the messengers, to be the ambassadors of the message, is really a critical piece to this. Um, and we've worked very hard to do that across Long Island, to really look at you know, our barbers, our check cashing facilities, our faith, our clergy, our you know, all the different people who um, people interact with, and then all the people who are places of trust. Um, and that's so important to do. So thank you so much. I'm happy to stick around and chat with anybody, but thank you for being Census Ambassadors. Thank you for hitting 10 people by the end of the week. Thank you for making it happen. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Did I, did I not say she was passionate? <laughs> Very passionate, oh. uh, Rebecca, on behalf of the Legislative Committee and oh, our students so that are not here tonight, but are, we have some graduate students here. Uh, I'd like to present you. Thank you so much. Oh, you. that is so beautiful. Thank you. Maybe we can get a picture. You want me to turn that off? So yes, you can get a picture. Sure. Can I grab a picture, Kev? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Fred, you want to come in the picture? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. That is so thoughtful. <laughs> Do you want to raise it? Where are we going? Oh, it's going to raise. Oh. We're going to go right back to the back. Oh, that's great. This is a great facility. Really great. What number here? So, okay. Come on. You got to get a picture too. Scooch a little bit this way so you're more centered on the banner. Scooch a little bit more. Scooch it. We got one more. We have another student here. Graduate student. Yes. Perfect. He's gonna grab one more. He's just gonna grab okay. our camera. If that's okay. All right. Hang out, guys. One more. One more. <laughs> Julie, you wanna get in? Uh, Blackstone, right now. Blackstone. Oh, very good. Where's the Blackstone? Uh, I honestly do the building in my backyard right now. Eventually, I hope thank you get a like, so professional shot. I don't know. <laughs> At this point. <laughs> All right. Furniture welded, and he said, you don't do anything under $100,000. <laughs> so you're in a good, you're in a good bargain. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. This is so lovely. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Rebecca, I'm going to call on you to get some more information. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Great, great. Yes. I have cards in the back. Four of them. What's that? Four of them. Uh, four of the toolkits? What am I uh, getting? Cards. The cards. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.